going on an adventure. So there's only one way to figure it all out. Unzip the archaeology. Make it naked. All the stories we know about Jesus and his time come to us from the Gospels. Jesus healing the lepers, the miracle of loaves and fish, his last supper, and his miraculous resurrection. But all of these stories come to us from writers with a religious agenda. Is there any evidence outside the Gospels that confirms that Jesus actually existed? Only one in the writings of a first century historian named Flavius Josephus. And here's what he wrote. About this time there lived Jesus, a wise man, if one ought to call him a man. He was the Messiah. Surprisingly, this is the only reference of Jesus outside the New Testament. But the question is, can we trust the reference and its author? Josephus is arguably the most important historian to Western civilization. Everything we know about the first century Jewish war with Rome, the archaeology of Second Temple Jerusalem, and the world in which Jesus lived and taught depends entirely on the prolific writings of Josephus. And yet, he is also reputed to be a liar and a braggart, a traitor to his own people who would say or do anything to stay alive. Begging the question, what, if anything, that Josephus wrote can we now trust as history? Can archaeology help us answer that question? I'm traveling to Israel to get a closer look at the places Josephus wrote about. But first, I need to know more about the man. First off, a chat with archaeologist Gabi Barkai to find out this. Who was the real Josephus? He uh, was born somewhere here in the place where we sit right now, in the upper city of Jerusalem. This was the area of the Jerusalemite aristocracy. He was born here and was from a priestly family. Uh, he, uh, as a youth, worked in the uh, temple of Jerusalem as a priest. Later on, he was among those who planned uh, the uh, defense of Jerusalem against uh, the Romans. He was a revolutionary. Yes, yes. Josephus was from a priestly family. At the age of 29, he was appointed commander of Galilee by the Jewish revolutionary government. But he was a reluctant fighter. He believed opposition to Rome was national suicide. When the Romans unleashed the full strength of their military, he found himself surrounded just outside what is modern-day Yodefat. I traveled to the Galilee to get a sense of the place where Josephus and his revolutionary army were holed up. Imagine this. Josephus is hiding out in a cave, like this one, with a group of religious zealots who are determined to resist the Romans to the bitter end. Josephus knows that resistance is useless, but he needs to find a way to stay alive. So he convinces his comrades to kill themselves. Josephus? Oh, Babu. Okay, come. <laughs> so suddenly, Josephus was left with the last of the defenders. They hid out in caves. The Romans were everywhere. They had a choice, surrender to the Romans or kill themselves. So Josephus gave this brilliant speech to convince the other rebels that if they were going to commit suicide, they should do it by lottery. Ten people were chosen by lot to kill everybody. And the plan was that the final defenders would cast lots again and the last man left would fall on his own sword. <laughs> Josephus must have been a pretty good poker player because as it turns out, the last lot was cast and it fell to him. And guess what? He didn't kill himself, he surrendered. But in order to survive the cave, Josephus would have had to be a mathematical genius or at least a really good chess player. 
And as one of the only survivors of the cave suicides, Josephus was also the only person to document the event, raising suspicions of the accuracy of his story. I discussed this with Annette Yoshiko Reed, who specializes in all things Josephus. You know, was that divine intervention or was he very good at cards? How did he manage <laughs> to be the last guy? I don't know. It's, it's not clear from the account. The account leaves open, first of all, that he was just buying time. I mean, it is possible that he came up with the idea because as people would actually kill him, kill themselves, he'd have more chance of persuading them, which is what he was trying to do in the first place. It's one way to win an election. Exactly, just narrow the vote. <laughs> <laughs> There's a rather compelling speech that he makes there. Um, so maybe he was trying to buy himself time. That's one possibility. Um, the other possibility, which he says, is that he does seem to think that the hand of God is somehow involved in him being saved from the cave and from the war in general. So it, it is arguable that he did think of himself as having some divine role. And then the other possibility is he just did some math. <laughs> when Josephus was captured by the Roman general Vespasian, he played his best hand at poker ever. He told Vespasian that he had had a vision and predicted that Vespasian would become the next emperor of Rome. Not immune to flattery, Vespasian took Josephus under his wing, sparing his life. Sure enough, Vespasian did become the next emperor and then commissioned Josephus to write a history of the Jewish revolt. Josephus moved to Rome and was branded a traitor, accused of living in the lap of luxury while his fellow Jews continued to suffer under Roman rule. But why would a Roman emperor let a Jewish rebel write the history of the Roman victory over Judea? The thing about Vespasian is Vespasian and his son Titus actually didn't have very many military triumphs. So it was very important to them to stress um, the capture of Judea. Josephus would want to make the, say that the Jews weren't nobodies. This was an important war. And in a weird way, it would be in the interest of the conquering emperor to say the same thing, because if they're nobodies, what's the big deal of winning a nothing war? Yes, yes. But if Josephus didn't mind exaggerating about his own life, then how can we trust his reference to Jesus, the only reference outside the Gospels? There's only one way to find out, strip his history naked and compare it to the archaeology. First century historian Flavius Josephus wrote in great detail about Jerusalem during Jesus' time. But because so much of what he wrote about himself appears to be exaggerated, can we trust him? Josephus knew how to spin a great yarn. For example, in his autobiography, he tells the story of how earlier in life, he survived a shipwreck in the middle of the Mediterranean and then swam all night to the shores of what is now Italy. Josephus' writing style is full of dramatic flourishes and what appears to be exaggeration. I asked Steve Mason, who has studied Josephus for years, if Josephus is believable as a historian. Is Josephus writing drama or history? Even the best historical writers have a great deal of drama in their history. All of these people are trained in rhetoric, and rhetoric is the art of compelling uh, people to listen to you, telling a good story, making them believe you. So there are set ways of doing that, and Josephus does them all. There's lots of drama. There are, one, one thing you do is, when you are writing a narrative, you can't be boring. You can't just tell one story continuously. You must break it up, change the scene, change who's involved in the, in the thing, change the location, jump around a little bit, say, meanwhile, over in Rome, this was happening. Or just come to a climax. So he's good at all of He's that. very good at it. He gets to a climax in his story. He says, no, let me pause right there. He would have been a screenwriter today. Exactly. <laughs> I asked archaeologist Gabi Barkai, can we trust him? Should he be vilified as a liar or praised as a historian. So uh, uh, Josephus, is he a disgusting traitor, a brilliant historian, a self promoter? We should thank him, we should thank him. Because as an archeologist, I can tell you that uh, digging in Jerusalem, digging in Caesarea, 
in Caesarea Philippi, in Herodium, in Masada, and various other spots, they come out very much fitting. The uh, picture... The, ar the archaeology fits... Uh, the archaeology fits perfectly the descriptions of Josephus. Josephus is a reliable source. But any historical source should be taken by scholars critically. In fact, when you review Josephus' writings critically, you can't help but notice the accuracy of his broader strokes. His writings have been used to uncover major archaeological sites, such as the one at Caesarea, a harbor that Josephus describes and archaeologists have confirmed as built in 21 BC at the whim of Herod the Great. Now a popular site for rock concerts, Caesarea was an entirely man-made port. Josephus' descriptions have also helped archaeologists reconstruct Jerusalem as it was before the Romans destroyed it. I met up with Professor Isaiah Gaffney, who took me on a walking tour of a miniature version of ancient Jerusalem. <laughs> but it's not what I expected. Yes, this is a model of a Jerusalem in the Second Temple period. This looks accurate. It is. How did they figure out all of this? Well, we have the well-known Jewish historian Josephus, who describes Jerusalem with great detail. And the details here are based you on Josephus. Physically, physically is accurate? Yes. In other words, we've done a lot of excavation in Jerusalem. And by and large, almost everything that Josephus describes physically, we can find, we can locate here. And it's built to scale, 1 to 50. The topography is exact as well. In other words, the higher spots, lower spots. Here you have the northern part of the city, with the wall, the southern part of the city, the Temple Mount, and the western gates of Jerusalem. And so the model really makes sense, and it all does come together. Whether Josephus knew it or not, his writings have fueled more than a few myths throughout the centuries. One myth in particular ended up being one of the greatest archaeological finds of the end of the 20th century, a fortress in the desert called Masada. But did he get it right? One of the greatest stories that Josephus ever spun was the history of Masada. Once thought to be nothing but a myth or a figment of his imagination, Masada now stands as arguably one of the greatest archaeological finds of all time. But how much of what Josephus wrote can be verified by the archaeology? I traveled to Masada to find out. From Josephus' writings, we know that Masada was a fortress where Jewish rebels led by Eliezer ben Yair held off the 10th legion of the Roman army for almost six years. According to Josephus, when the Romans finally breached Masada's gates, they discovered that the rebels were dead. They had committed mass suicide. This sounds remarkably similar to Josephus' account of Yodefat, where rebels chose death over surrender. And just like Yodefat, where Josephus made a speech convincing his followers to use lots to determine the order of death, Commander Ben Yair made a similar speech urging the same thing. Ben Yair, however, went through with the suicide. Archaeologist Guy Stiebel and his colleagues have found many artifacts that seem to confirm the Josephus story. They found skeletons, and they even think they found the lots that the rebels drew to determine the order of death. In the Josephus story, he says that the, the, the defenders of Masada voted, they, they, they cast lots. Each one went to his own family, embraced them, killed them. Mm -hmm. Here you excavate, there's a skeleton of a man, a skeleton of a woman, a skeleton of a child. Uh, it and, seems and, and, to and fit. Now, and now we have to stop and, and we go back into science. I mean, it, it's very tempting to take the narration of Josephus, I mean, his account, and, and, and say, OK, this is what we have here. It is very tempting. However, when we look at the hard evidence, um, evidence seems to be less uh, convincing. convincing in a way. Uh, and now there are scholars that um, explain the, the, this, this discovery of, of three skeletons here by the work of the hyenas that brought skeletons. So they say Herod's palace became a hyena den, yeah. and the hyenas dragged 
in a way. I mean, what, one of the chambers. But this is, again, this is interpretation. They drag bodies, and therefore we think they're the defenders. But really, yes. all we've discovered... This is one of the explanations. Uh, but stating that this is for sure the remains of, of rebels, that, uh, the last defenders that commit suicide, we can't. The fact that Masada was under siege by the Romans, as described by Josephus, is now no longer disputed. Within the fortress walls, archaeologists have discovered hundreds of the ancient world's version of cannonballs. Josephus also described the Roman camp, and archaeologists have found that too. So Josephus seems to be totally credible. But as Gabi Barkai tells me, some of what Josephus wrote was an outright lie. Josephus writes that Masada was all of it built of white marble. Not even one piece of one white marble was found in Masada. More than that, in the early Roman period, there was no marble in use at all in Palestine. Why does he say so? Probably he looked at Masada from down below. A possible other reason would be that he wrote in Rome. And in Rome, no building uh, is regarded glorious if it is not built of marble. So he said so it, had, he, it was he, all marble. Uh, he uh, wrote it for his readers in Rome. If he's together, messing with the facts, how, why do you think he is, why do you rely on him? Altogether, he is reliable. He is reliable. He is reliable. Archaeologically speaking, uh, whatever he tells us proved to be uh, correct. The only other archaeology that seems to confirm Josephus' story are the pottery shards discovered at Masada that appear to be the lots used in the suicide pact. But as Steve Mason explains, this also can't be considered hard evidence towards proving Josephus' entire narrative. The lots are very compelling. By the lots, I guess you mean they're all of these pieces of broken pottery shards, shards, pottery, shards. pottery shards. And uh, in a few cases, you have names written on these shards. Uh, some scholars say, hey, matches almost perfectly. Um, here you have these names, what else would they be? But the possibilities for why you have these names on shards are you know, almost endless. It could be, if you're living up there, there are any number of reasons why you might have uh, people's names on shards to mark out. Uh, you might know, say, this is my, my this little is where, area. Where this, is is, my this is where my bed is, this is where my family is. Uh, Don't touch my condo. Yeah, or here's an IOU, here's my share of the food, uh, something like that. We just have really no idea. It's a nice theory, but it doesn't prove anything. Whether or not Josephus' story at Masada was partially invented or completely true, without him, we would know nothing about Masada. Today, Masada stands as a kind of Jewish Alamo, the last stand against the Romans, and in that sense, it's also the symbol of modern Israel. But forget about Josephus the liar, never mind his betrayal. It seems four out of five archaeologists agree that Josephus as a historian is a major source for first century Israel. But others see him as much more important, since he's also the only writer outside the Gospels who wrote about the existence of Jesus. But what exactly did he write? As we look at the history of the first century, we find no surviving records, whether Roman or Jewish, that support the accounts of the Christian Bible or the existence of Jesus, except for one the writings of Josephus. In two passages, Josephus seems to be referring to Jesus of Nazareth. I met with Professor Steve Mason to find out what exactly Josephus had to say about Jesus. Does he mention Jesus? That's a bit of a controversy. He mentions some 21 guys, I think, named Jesus. And one of those he mentions is Jesus of Nazareth. He talks about Jesus in two places. The most certain one is not when he's talking about Jesus, actually. He's talking about his brother James. And he says that he was executed as a lawbreaker and troublemaker. And he says he was the brother of the so-called Christos, the so-called Christ, Jesus. But if Josephus calls Jesus a so-called Messiah in one instance, in the second instance, he seems to have no doubts. About this time, there lived Jesus, 
a wise man if one ought to call him a man, for he was one who performed surprising deeds. He was a teacher of such people who accepted the truth gladly. He won over many Jews and many Greeks. He was the Messiah. But as Steve Mason tells me, this passage is controversial. He almost certainly didn't write that passage. Why? Because he wrote 30 volumes, and he's always talking about how great Judaism is. He never elsewhere mentions a Messiah. He never mentions the need for a Messiah. He doesn't like messianic figures. He does mention a number of people who were kind of quasi-messiahs, who attracted large followings. He really, really doesn't like these people, he sees them as troublemakers. and and kind of uh, demagogues, people who could, you know, persuade a large mass of ignorant people to follow them. So he, he just doesn't like that kind of person. So what, for him to say of this man out of the blue, oh, by the way, he was the Messiah, it makes absolutely no sense. I'm confused. If Josephus didn't write it, who did? Annette Yoshiko Reed says it's the work of Christian scribes added years later. That seems to be a later edition. It seems, it's actually pretty clear that it is a later edition. That's important in a different way. <laughs> it's important because if it weren't for that aspect, we probably wouldn't have the works of Josephus today because that was one of the things that spurred the Christian transmission of these works over the centuries. Meaning the scribe who added that line in probably saved Josephus because yes. he made him more important to Christian theology. Yes, I think so. So here's the irony. The fact that Josephus mentioned Jesus caused his words to be preserved by the church. Had they not altered his writings, Josephus' works would probably have been lost. So let me get this straight. Josephus is a scoundrel, but we should be happy that he was a scoundrel because he probably saved all this history for us. And whoever tinkered with Josephus was a faker, but we should be <laughs> happy with him because he probably saved Josephus for us. Yeah, in one sense, yeah. Josephus turns out to be an incredibly complex character. For years, scholars thought he was nothing more than a myth maker, inventing stories and exaggerating to boost his own importance. But it turns out he was an incredibly accurate historian. His descriptions of first century Israel, from Masada to Caesarea, to his descriptions of the actual layout of Jerusalem, turned out to be incredibly precise. Some thought he was a bit of a scoundrel, someone who ingratiated himself to the Romans to save his own skin. But could it be that he was actually a hero? Josephus compares himself to the defenders of Masada and points out that had he too fallen on his own sword, Masada would have been forgotten. And while the description of Jesus as the Messiah attributed to Josephus seems to be a forgery. The fact is that his writings and his writings alone are still the only validation of Jesus as a historical figure. The New Testament story of Jesus' birth has been told thousands of times. Long ago, in Nazareth, there lived a young woman named Mary. One day, an angel appeared and told her she had been chosen to have God's son. Soon after, Mary and her husband Joseph set off on a difficult journey to Bethlehem. Then, in a stable, Mary gave birth to a bouncing baby boy and put him in a manger full of hay. They were visited by some shepherds, some animals, three wise men, and a couple of angels, too. Every year, billions of people around the world celebrate Jesus' birth. The Bible gives us details of the nativity story, but barely mentions anything about the next 30 years of Jesus' life. These are the lost years. And what he did in his youth is open to a variety of interpretations, which have evolved for over 2,000 years. With archaeology as my guide, I'm going to retrace the footsteps of the young Jesus. I'll go where he went and see what he saw, trying to unravel the truth from tradition. My search begins where it all began, the little town of Bethlehem. This is the traditional place of the birth of Jesus. This is where the manger is supposed to be. And this is where the Magi are supposed to have come. The star led them to this very place according to Christian lore. This is the traditional Bethlehem. But is it the Bethlehem of archaeology? 
This is exciting. This is the Church of Nativity. We're talking about a 1,600-year-old church. Now, we could stay in line here, or we could say, we're television. We don't have to stay in line. This church, believed to be built on top of the manger where Jesus was born, is one of the oldest in Christendom. From crusader kings to kindergarten classes, millions of people have been coming here for the better part of two millennia. You really got to grab what you can over here because the uh, faithful are stampeding. What? Right now, tourism is down. Imagine what it was like when tourism was out. That's the traditional place of Jesus' birth, right over there. X marks the spot where the virgin birth is supposed to have taken place, according to uh, tradition, and where the gospel story is kind of uh, matched to the archaeology, and a tradition that's now some 1,500 years old. So we'll get out of their way. And over there is the, the manger. This is where supposedly uh, baby Jesus was put in a, a little crib or a trough, right over here. Now you notice that there is archaeology here. You can see the stone, the original stone. Traditionally, it's interpreted as being some kind of barn, but you see it's not a barn. It makes sense that this would have been somebody's home. It looks like a basement, really. It's a big grotto. 1,500 years of Christian tradition points to this location as the birthplace of Jesus. It's here that archaeology meets with the biblical account. The story continues with Jesus and his family moving to Nazareth. So I think a trip to his old hometown is in order. Maybe a walk around his old neighborhood will reveal something about Jesus' early life. The Nazareth Historical Village is a living museum situated on the ruins of a first century farm in present-day Nazareth. Here, a team of biblical scholars and archaeologists are working together to recreate a village that resembles in every way what archaeology tells us about where Jesus grew up. Shalom, peace upon you all. Here, I meet up with Steve and Claire Fawn, New Testament scholars and experts on first century life. Tell me what this place is about. Well, what we have here is the reconstruction of first century life. As a location, this is only 500 meters away from where Jesus lived. So we know that it existed during the time of Jesus and his family. Is this based on Hollywood's version of what things look like, or is this solid archaeology? We've built these buildings out of the same rock, the same mortar, the same roof beams that would have been used back in the first century. This actually looks ancient, this hole in the ground. What you find here is a drain in which rainwater can come down. You've got the water coming down here. It's collecting the rainwater, right? Yeah and it's pouring down there. This is a settling pool, so all the dirt can settle to the bottom before it goes up and into the hole down into the cistern inside the wall there. Take, take us in. As you would in a normal house, you'd be coming into a, a courtyard like this. This is really normal neat. House. See, you guys are good. The, the story here is, is rebuilding first century life. If you want to understand the Bible or the period, you have to be like a detective going back to the scene. Some of the major archeologists have come through here and they have really said, now I finally feel like I'm inside a first century town. It comes alive. Instead of looking at some rocks on the, on, on the floor, you're sitting here, you could just see that second level. Right. Sweetie, come down for dinner. You know, I could just... That's it. It's amazing. I can still hear them arguing after all these years. It's, it's definitely a Jewish home. Yeah. Steve shows me a replica of the type of house Jesus grew up in, the carpenter shop where he would have helped his father, and the synagogue where he would have prayed. From this recreated village, we can actually envision the early home life of Jesus. He probably lived like any other boy in first century Galilee. He would have gone to school, hopped around the house, and played with the neighborhood kids. After a whirlwind tour, the only thing I haven't seen is a manger. Steve's wife, Claire, takes over the tour to talk about the nativity scene. So he's, you're, you're better with mangers? Well, I think I'm better with childbirth. This is the deal. <laughs> I think that was the implication there. Having you're, you're a scholar as well, right? Yeah, I work in New Testament and teach New Testament courses. When we think of the whole uh, nativity story and yeah. being born in, in a manger, you kind of almost think of a European or American farm where they're being sent off to the barn. Because of Christmas cards and film and media, we have a picture of Mary on a donkey in labor 
in the pouring rain, and Joseph arriving at a strange city and going from door to door, knocking at every hotel and motel, and everyone says, sorry, we're full up, and your poor pregnant wife who's in labor can't come in and have a room. <laughs> but if we set all of that aside, and we just work with the text of the Bible, first off it says there was this census, and they were returning to Bethlehem because it was the ancestral home of Joseph's family. If it's their patriarchal home, that means there's a network of relatives Everybody already saying, living Hi, there. Hi, how are you, long time? Exactly, it's a patriarchal <laughs> home. <and laughs> long time no see. It's a huge family occasion. Also, though, the house is packed to overflowing because everyone who's part of the family has to come for this particular census. So my understanding of this story, then, is that because the house was so full, because there was no room in the guest room, when Mary went into labor, the question was, where can she have this baby in peace and quiet with some privacy? And the best suggestion they could come up with room like that. was to empty out the storeroom and lay down fresh hay and give her a little bit of privacy. So this is what it probably looked like. It didn't look like an American barn, right? Claire takes me to a grotto that looks very similar to the basement of the Church of the Nativity. Unlike an American barn, this is actually a basement cave. I think a basement is much more like what we would call it. I'm not a woman, but it, it seems to me that I wouldn't mind giving birth. Yeah, and cozy and private. I'd like a little more light, maybe. Well, here's and a little Mary offered her oil lamp, little yeah, area. Yeah, there's a little yeah, first right. century type oil lamp. So that lamp. Mary, you know. Yeah, they would have lit it with oil lamps. I like your manger. It's a nice. Thank you. It's a nice <laughs> manger. That's one of those things. Claire dispels some commonly held notions of the nativity scene. And it's a good reminder of how a traditional story told over the ages evolves into something very different from the original. So with all that straightened out, I'm heading off to meet with an archaeologist who says the story of the nativity may be right, but the location is all wrong. My next stop is a short drive from Nazareth to the ruins of an ancient town called Bethlehem. It's the little-known Bethlehem of the Galilee, 120 kilometers north of the Judean Bethlehem, where most think Jesus was born. Here I'm meeting with archaeologist Aviram Oshri. Oshri thinks everyone's got the wrong Bethlehem, and his proof begins with a large wall surrounding this tiny village. This is Bethlehem of Galilee. This is the Galilean Bethlehem? Yeah. We're coming towards Galilean Bethlehem now. Now what's this? This is the wall. These are big blocks. Mm -hmm. If I would have just been wandering around here, I would have thought that these stones are just some kind of terracing system. But in a minute, I'll show you why it can't be just a simple terrace. Why? Because there is a rampart, a built rampart, leading into the, the city. So it's a real fortification. Yeah. Here we see a rampart, which is connected to the wall. It's built on both sides, and it leads us upwards into the city. Walls and ramparts were the primary defenses of ancient cities. These Byzantine fortifications suggest that a powerful city once stood here. But Bethlehem of the Galilee was a tiny village. What could these later Christians have been protecting? So yeah. this, this is not a small village. It's a small village by size. A small village with a very big fortification. Yeah. Ah. You can see the continuation of the wall. Usually you find that kind of walls in uh, big cities like uh, Jerusalem. It's quite unique for a village that small to be fortified. So you're saying the fact that there is such a significant wall for what otherwise would be a small little village must mean that the Christians care a lot about this particular village. Yeah, exactly. You think through excavations like this, you've actually found the place of the nativity. I do believe that uh, this is the site uh, of the nativity. If Oshri is right, how did Matthew and Luke, writing a few decades after Jesus' death, confuse the Bethlehems? How do you explain the fact that it seems to be a very old tradition in the other place and total silence on this place? I would suggest Christianity wanted to uh, turn uh, Jesus into a Messiah. And according to the Old Testament, the Messiah should come from David's house. And David came from Bethlehem near Jerusalem. That is why Jesus had to come from that Bethlehem. The biblical prophets predicted that the Messiah will come from the family of King David, who hailed from Bethlehem of the south. Saying that Jesus was born there fulfills the prophecy and proves his Messiahship. Was this all a bit of early religious spin? To help answer this, I'm meeting with Dr. John Kloppenberg, professor of religion at the University of Toronto. Let's start with uh, Jesus and uh, where he was born. 
I mean, of course, the tradition is it says Bethlehem, but there were two Bethlehems, as it turns out. Is it possible that Jesus' birthplace was kind of moved for ideological reasons because to be born in the Galilee would not be where a Messiah should be born? When, when we have so little data, uh, almost anything is theoretically possible. But I would say that the prior question is, why would we think that he's born in Bethlehem at all? The basis for connecting Jesus' birth with Bethlehem is very slender. It appears only in Matthew's Gospel and in Luke's Gospel, which are written at the latest stratum of, uh, of Christian tradition. The earlier levels of the Gospel traditions, and connect him with Nazareth. I mean, he's known as Jesus of Nazareth or Jesus the Nazarene. The Gospel of John, interestingly, has someone say, uh, he can't be the Messiah because we all know that the Messiah is the son of David and the Messiah comes from Bethlehem. The implication being that everybody knows that Jesus doesn't come from Bethlehem. And uh, both Matthew and Luke, when they talk about Bethlehem as the, the birthplace of Jesus, they're interested in connecting Jesus with David. And Bethlehem is David's town. So you're saying it could be that he was given a birthplace in the right town after the fact? That's right. Once Christians say that he's the Messiah, if he's a Davidic Messiah, then surely the Davidic Messiah must have been born in Bethlehem. Then you have to create stories that explain the birth in Bethlehem. According to Dr. Kloppenberg, not only is Bethlehem in question, but the entire nativity story as well. The only thing that everyone seems to agree on is that Jesus grew up in Nazareth, but there's nothing left there to excavate. However, just four miles away is the spectacular ancient city of Sephoris. Here, I hope to find some clues about the lost years of Jesus. Tradition portrays Jesus as a humble country boy growing up in the sleepy town of Nazareth. But excavations in the nearby city are forcing scholars to rethink this old quaint notion. Once known as the Jewel of the Galilee, this Roman city, Sephoris, continues to dazzle visitors with the ruins of an opulent marketplace, lavish theater, and beautiful mosaics. Wow, this is amazing. She is beautiful, isn't she? Since it was only four miles from his front door, wouldn't the young Jesus have been influenced by Sephoris? To understand more, I met up with David Gorin, historian and tour guide. This is a huge site. Eh? It's a huge site, and it was uh, amazing that it mostly was unknown until 1984. So where are we going? To the theater, of course. It's showtime. It's showtime. Wow, this is impressive. Let me try the acoustics. OK, you stay here. Chiseled into bedrock, this theater can seat 4,000. On the stage, stage. Can you hear me? I can hear you, fine. The acoustics are pretty good. This is the hallmark of Hellenistic culture, theater, acting. Jesus lived very closely here. How far is Nazareth from here? Around four miles. Four miles. There's no way that a carpenter's son could have lived four miles from here and not come into touch with this place, right? There's no way that if you lived in the Galilee, you wouldn't meet Roman culture. One piece of compelling evidence that Jesus visited Sephoris isn't supplied by archaeology, but by the Bible itself. Scholars have wondered where Jesus picked up the word hypocrite, a Greek word meaning actor, and a word that Jesus used 24 times in the Gospels. There's a good chance that Jesus learned this word from plays performed in Greek here at Sephoris. Now look at the Gospels. Jesus is born in Bethlehem. He grows up in Nazareth, and Sephoris is never, ever mentioned. This was the center of Roman culture. And I bet you Jesus didn't have very many good things to say about Roman culture. So when the new religion, Christianity, was being sold to the Romans, suddenly every reference to Sephoris is edited out. Was this the work of ancient editors, or was Sephoris just not important enough to make it into the good book? I asked Dr. Klopfenberg for his opinion. Why do you think Sephora is such a big city, right in Jesus' backyard, is not mentioned? You would sort of expect an important city to be mentioned, and the fact that it's not is a bit of a puzzle. Perhaps even more puzzling that Sephoris is so close to Nazareth, and I would suppose that it would have been a place that Jesus visited and perhaps a place that both Jesus and his father worked in. That's where all the, the work was. 
Yeah, exactly. So why do you think it's not mentioned? I don't have any answer for why it's not mentioned. Um, it may not have been mentioned because it was a pro-Roman site. It's conceivable that there were, that I suppose that Jesus made anti-Roman statements and those have been edited out. But we don't really have any, any strong evidence of that. So explaining silences is always a very difficult thing for historians. With no written evidence, all we can do is piece together a picture based on the archaeology. David takes me to the remains of an ancient home where the Roman and Greek influences can be seen in the mosaics left behind. The section of Sephorus has never been seen by the public. You have to pick up everything. What? It's there for a reason, no? It's the archaeologist in me. I have to just peek. Oh, look at that. Unveiled for the first time. Quite beautiful, actually. They're it playing. looks like they're playing a game. Yeah. They're playing dice, gambling. Mm -hmm. This place, religiously speaking, it's a den of sin. They're playing dice, games of chance. They got two guys dancing there. He's drinking and getting drunk. Jesus wouldn't have wanted to eat here. He wouldn't have trusted that the food is kosher enough, and these pictures would have offended him. This city of wealth and earthly delights provides a stark contrast to the farming village of Nazareth. Sephorus, with its pagan culture and decadent lifestyle, represents many of the things that Jesus would later preach against. It seems obvious to me that Jesus was influenced by the city. I'm heading back to Bethlehem of the Galilee, where Professor Oshri claims he has one final clue for his alternative nativity location. I'm back with Professor Oshri at the other Bethlehem in Galilee. It was here just 12 years ago that he uncovered the remains of a massive Byzantine church. We're on our way to check out where the church once stood and where Oshri believes that Jesus was really born. It wasn't a church under the highway. There was a church over the highway. Yes, exactly. Right? Right over here. Look, these guys are upset with us. Don't blame us. You're in a church. You're driving in the middle of a church. Really? This is a very different kind of church than I've ever been in before. <laughs> so this, this side road over there, that's where it started. And how far did it go? Uh, up to the oak tree. That's a big church. That's a big point in your favor. Why would somebody build in the middle of a little village in the Galilee a huge church like that, surrounded by a huge wall? Exactly. Now, where, where you mentioned there was a natural cave somewhere? Yeah, just uh, yeah, the behind the, the oak tree. I've seen it in the early 90s and it disappeared afterwards. Where? Somewhere here. What do you mean it disappeared? It was covered with the dirt, with soil. You say that behind this oak tree, you saw a natural cave. Yeah. So there's an entire church built around this natural cave. If you're right, mm -hmm. this is where in Byzantine time, they probably believed that the cave was the place where Jesus was born. Wouldn't it be quite easy to figure out if there's a cave there by just digging in the earth? Yeah, there's no problem in doing it. You just need the uh, finance. But watch out, we are <laughs> breaking the law now. We're breaking the law, why? <laughs> because we are not allowed to excavate without the permission. But look, look what we found here. You could see the top of the thing, where the dirt is. I mean, you could see that this is filled in. Mm -hmm. Are you going to give me a footnote that I rediscovered <laughs> the, the, the scene of the nativity? Yeah. yeah? <laughs> Archaeology in action. <laughs> Could it be that behind this muddy wall is the actual birthplace of Jesus? I wonder if the people living above here know about any of this. Now, is that house sitting on top of the cave of the nativity, according to your theory? If I'm right. I, I want to meet these people. I'd like to meet these people. He's embarrassed. He's too embarrassed to come. Do you think they speak English? Hello? It's open. It's open. Hello? Hello. I just want to ask you some questions about... And there's the, the archaeologist. <laughs> what? You should warm me first. <laughs> yeah? I see your bags are packed over here. When are you due? Storage. Any day? Any day. Really? Did you realize that you have a backyard archaeological place? Yes, yeah? there was a, a Byzantic uh, church here. We might be raising the value of your property a lot. Do you know that? No, how? Yeah, but why don't you tell her your theory? Why don't you tell her seriously? 
I'm suggesting that Jesus was born here rather than uh, the Bethlehem near Jerusalem. Are you going to do a home birth? No. No? Because if you do a home birth, and if this is the place where Jesus was born, your kid can be born where Jesus was born. Wow. <laughs> okay, this is good. This is archaeology in action. If I had doubts about Oshri's theory before, finding a pregnant woman above this possible nativity site is definitely a sign in his favor. Jesus' lost years end around age 30 when he's baptized by John and his ministry begins. I've retraced the footsteps of Jesus from Bethlehem to Nazareth. I've touched the very spot where Christian tradition says he was born. I've walked around his hometown and seen firsthand what it was like where he grew up. At Sephoris, I've seen the powerful influences that helped shape Jesus' philosophy. I've heard some new theories and made up some of my own. Most of the early life of Jesus remains a mystery, but now, for the first time, archaeology is providing a clearer picture of the formative years of the man at the heart of Christianity. Here's a story, one of the most famous ever told. Here, 2,000 years ago, in Jerusalem's old city streets, Jesus carried his cross. That executioner's tool, the cross, became Christianity's most potent symbol. But it wasn't just Jesus who met death this way. The Romans executed tens of thousands on the cross. Today, it's one of the world's most famous images, but that image is unclear. Here's the question. How does someone die on the cross? What physically happens? How do nails in the hand lead to death on a cross? We're about to travel the world seeking answers. New York. For different people's arm lengths, we have different holes along the, uh, the, the cross so that each one would line up. Because if you're nailing a person, you're nailing their hand straight out. London. Well, like the nails, these are the, these are the actual nails that went through my hand. I feel I'm not really interested in possessions. You've probably seen from I don't really own very much, but I've got a kind of magical attachment to these, really. And where no host has gone before. But like most biblical archaeology stories, this one starts in... Jerusalem. During the days of the first century, Roman emperors Caligula and Nero, thousands of people would be crucified here along busy highways like this one. The Romans crucified slaves, traitors, and rebels. To make an example of them, deterrence, in the place where the so-called crime took place, usually the crime was resistance to the Roman Empire. Tens of thousands died on the cross. What most people don't know is this. Archaeologists have found nothing, well, almost nothing, to prove that anyone was ever crucified. How can this be? Like all good stories, let's start with a twist, a twisted nail. This is the only physical evidence in the world proving crucifixion happened. What you see here is the heel bone, the foot of this crucified man, with the iron nail going through it, piercing it. but. This isn't real. It was shown to me by Dudi Mevorach, a curator at the Israel Museum. Uh, when bones are found in excavations in Israel, after a short investigation, we rebury them. And the same is true for this uh, bone of the crucified man from Jerusalem. So what I'm holding here and what we are exhibiting at the museum is actually a copy, a perfect copy of that. This was found together with the whole skeleton, the skeleton of Yohanan, which was about 24 to 28 years of age. We uh, know his name. We know his name, Yohanan, a young man. We don't know the crime for which he was crucified. Why Yohanan was crucified is less interesting than what he was crucified on. The wood of his cross had a knot. As the nail passed through his heel and into the cross, it hit stronger uh, part of the wood and got bent, preventing it to be pulled out. So 2,000 years ago, they nail a Jew to a cross in Jerusalem. 
because they choose one height as opposed to another height, it hits something stronger than a nail. At that moment, the nail bends and starts a whole chain of events that allow us to find the only crucified bone ever. You know, the archaeology is all about tragedy and chance. Persians, Assyrians, Celts, and Germans practiced crucifixion. Many scholars say the Carthaginians pounded the first nail. The Romans didn't invent crucifixion. They merely perfected it. A twist of fate, a twisted nail. It gives us the only physical evidence in the world of a crucified man. But tens of thousands died on the cross. Why is there no evidence? Where are the other iron nails and splintered heels? You know, they used to crucify thousands of people along the roads here. And if they crucified so many people, how come there's no archaeological evidence? How come there's no archaeological evidence except one person? I don't know how. You have to know how. But why is there no evidence? I, I don't know why. <laughs> but does that mean it didn't happen? Maybe it's happened. Maybe. So it doesn't mean just because they don't have any archaeological evidence doesn't mean anything. <laughs> I don't know. Everybody here is into archaeology. Where is the evidence? Well, we can't answer that until we learn how crucifixion worked. It turns out the best place in the world to get answers is a small town in New York. There, in a tidy family garage, next to the lawnmower and sprinkler, a father puts his son on the cross. Dr. Frederick Zugib is a New York pathologist, a medical detective investigating causes of death. His books include Crucifixion of Jesus, a Forensic Inquiry. Dr. Zugib is trying to find out what happens to a body on the cross. From the lashing. They called them scorpions, and they would dig right into the flesh and, and rip. To the nails. When the nail goes through that area, it hits the media nerve, as they explain. They're one of the worst pains ever experienced by man. To the mechanics of hanging on a cross. Then what happens? The cramping in the legs. Well, what they did was they'd arch the body, and that would extend the legs to remove some of the cramps. Dr. Zugib isn't studying alone. Meet Dr. Zugib's son, Tom. For the past 16 years, I've been a local judge, and I have my own private practice of law. He's been going up on the cross for his father for 31 years. You must be the most crucified man. I would think. You're the most crucified man ever. There's not much you could do to me, right? Uh, that's right. <laughs> that hasn't been true. You know what, he was, he was the uh, uh, executive assistant district attorney uh, for a number of years. And when he left the office, they did a roast on him. And I loaned them pictures of him yeah. up on the cross. They said, this is what his father used to do. Uh, whenever he was bad, whenever to punish him, <laughs> he would crucify him. Dr. Zugib tests oxygen levels, blood pressure, heart rate. So does anybody else do this anywhere in the world? <laughs> Are you the world's expert on crucifixion? Pretty much. Pretty much because nobody has done, people have just speculated. There's even been a paper in a journal of the American Medical Association from, uh, from the Mayo Clinic just speculation, no experimentation at all. Fortunately, no one else in the world conducts live crucifixion experiments. Over the centuries, artists occasionally nailed cadavers to crosses to get the right pose. Lately, Mel Gibson gave us some of the most visceral images yet. But Dr. Zugib says the road warrior got it wrong because Gibson exaggerated the lashing for entertainment value. No one could have survived the lashing Gibson gave Jesus. And then they uh, scourged him for about nine to 10 minutes straight uh, with the big bruisers coming down on him using a flagrum with sharp edged uh, pieces. Well, I think about five or six lashes like that would have killed him uh, from my experience as a forensic pathologist. He, ne he never would have made it to the cross. 
He would not have made it to the cross. First of all, his breathing would have been terrible. If you get punched in the chest, when one punch, you have difficulty breathing. To carry a 200-pound cross, as he did in a movie, he would have been almost impossible. Mel Gibson would say, now, I you've, have never a case. Seen any, you've never seen anybody flayed, so how do you know? Yeah. Well, I have a case just about a year and a half ago of a young individual who was beaten by the stepfather with a belt and lamp cord. The individual died. Both lungs were collapsed. The um, inside of the chest wall was all hemorrhage, all hemorrhagic. They tried resuscitating the individual after, could not resuscitate the individual. So this 18-year-old in good shape didn't survive just a, a Just a, a beating with a belt and, a, and a, a lamp cord. So Mel got it wrong. No one could have survived Gibson's lashing and then carried a cross. But Christians do believe the real Jesus made it to the cross. That's the image most of us have. But it comes from art, not archaeology or science. The common way that people perceive crucifixion is uh, the way the artistic uh, descriptions are of the crucifixion of Jesus, with uh, the, the feet one on top of the other, with the nail driven through both of them into the uh, upright beam of the cross. But there was a great variety. Peter Richardson, professor of religious studies at the University of Toronto. Sometimes his feet are, are on a ledge, sometimes he's nailed to the cross, sometimes, you know, the nails seem to go through the palm, sometimes through the wrist. Was, it there, was there one way or variations? No, there were all sorts of varieties of crucifixion, upside down with arms extended, even uh, with the privates being nailed to the, to oh, the cross. Oh my. Uh, there were all, all sorts of, of variations, uh, X-shaped crosses, tau-shaped crosses, that is, uh, T-shaped crosses. No matter what type of cross was used, most of us think of the nails when we think of crucifixion. We're about to meet someone who can tell not the history, but the actual feeling. Sebastian Horsley, London painter and writer. The first Westerner to be crucified in Filipino crucifixion rituals. I first heard about the uh, crucifixion in the Philippines some years ago, and I went over to watch them crucify their own people. Once I realized it was possible to be crucified in the modern world, I knew this was something that was my calling. So I went there, and I offered to have myself crucified. Every Easter, a few villages in the Philippines reenact Jesus' passion. Some go so far as to drive nails through their hands. They strapped me to the cross and they... I wanted to think of something specific, like my girlfriend, when they, the nails went through the skin. Excruciating. From the Latin, excruciatus, meaning out of the cross. And as the nails went through, I started to black out, and they started to raise the cross, and I was in and out of consciousness, and I just, my eyes filled up with water. Well, the pain was m much worse than I thought. It was, how can I describe it? It was just like a com really severe, but also quite dull, a, because it broke through the skin. But I think one of the reasons that it, it was worse than I thought it was just the idea of what I was doing to myself. It's not really like anything in the modern world, is it? You can't really prepare for something like that. It's hard to understand why, today, anyone would want to be crucified. But why did the Romans choose crucifixion? Hanging was easier, feeding to wild animals more dramatic. The sword was faster. But the cross, the cross was special to the Romans. Why did crucifixion so absolutely satisfy Roman needs for nearly 800 years? Part of the answer 
is the power of humiliation. Humiliation and shame. It's, it's a death in shame. The Romans typically not only scourged the person who is to be executed ahead of time, but then often left the body on the cross so that it would simply disintegrate on the cross. There would be very little left. Uh, you know, jackals would pick at it from the bottom and, and carry in birds from the top. Humiliation with purpose, deterrence. Crucifixion was a public warning. The Romans wanted everyone to see what happened if you messed with them. So we're back to our first question. If so many thousands died on the cross, and the whole point was that as many people as possible witness the punishment, why is there so little evidence of crucifixion? Well, it turns out that there's more evidence than I first suspected. If archaeology is all about tragedy and chance, then chance was on my side. I was in Tel Aviv interviewing Dr. Arensberg, an expert in ancient forensics. The interview wasn't even about crucifixion. It was about leprosy. And then, from a pile of boxes on the floor, the good doctor pulled out a surprise. Do you oh, yes. recognize the crucifixion? Is this the original? This is the original? Yes, sir. This is the, the original. I've seen the fake one at the Israel Museum. Yeah. This is it. This is the original. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And you can this is the only example in the world yeah. of that a crucified man. That has been preserved till man. now. And this is a very, very important fact that proved that crucifixion existed. <laughs> you it's see? In, it's incredible. Yeah. This is fantastic. And how they and look at you turned. See. Yeah. Well, that they, that's why they probably couldn't get it out yeah. after the bay. It hit something hard, and yeah. can I? But take care. No, no, Not I, for this me. is a truly important archaeological. This is the only example of a crucified man, and this is the original. I've seen the plaster cast many times. I didn't even know that the original existed somewhere, but the professor has it right here in a box. It's, inc then this is it's really incredible. Very, very this is... Yeah. This is really History. very important. <laughs> oh, I would say that that's, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So we know thousands of people were crucified, and yet there seems to be no archaeological evidence except one. The first answer to that is this is what we found. We don't know about the rest. We know that there are many forms of crucifixion, uh, both from literary sources, but also from what we were able to reconstruct, even from that one uh, bone itself. So uh, if people, for instance, were crucified uh, with ropes, we won't find anything. Because the ropes? The ropes would decay with time, and we will have no evidence. The wood will also decay with time. When would an executioner choose a rope instead of a nail? It depended on economics of time. Example, the Romans crucified 6,000 slaves after the Spartacus Rebellion, probably using ropes. Nailing would have just taken too much work. The other factor is how long they wanted you to suffer. If you're hung with ropes, you can last for days. Nails, hours. But still, how did a nail in the hand hurry death? We know nails are painful, but a nail in the hand doesn't kill. For many years, the leading theory of death on the cross was asphyxiation. Dr. Zugib and Tom prove this theory is false. Here's how it works. In classic crucifixion, this is where the arms are. In this position, there's no problem breathing. Breathing doesn't become tough unless we raise the arms much higher. Okay, put your arms straight out. It's easy to breathe. Now, raise your arms. It's tough to breathe, right? You leave a person here the way we do our experiments for any length of time. We had people that had worked up to 30 minutes. That was the longest uh, we, we had. If you left them up there an hour and all, they'd start getting into shock. They'd start going into shock. And shock is central to our first question. What causes death 
on the cross. Concluded that the cause of death in crucifixion is hypovolemic shock and traumatic shock. To a layman, what, what happens when someone goes into hypovolemic shock? When a person shock? has hypovolemic shock, what literally happens is the heart fails as a pump because your volume is too low to maintain a blood pressure. Blood pressure drops from a loss of fluids, blood, sweat, the trauma of the lashing, nails, dehydration. So you put these all together, is that your blood pressure goes way, way down. The heart is pumping again, uh, trying to maintain this pressure. Finally, it fails. So you end up with a chromatic shock causing a cardiogenic shock and death. There are times in life when you realize, for better or worse, you only get one shot at something. This is one of those times. I don't think a host, you know how you have television, you have hosts, you know, they fly planes, they do all that. I don't think any host has ever gone up on the cross. Do you know about Zugebi? Yes. How long did he crucify you for? I'm on camera. I'm taking full responsibility. I went up there. His son, who's been training for years, is doing this, lasts about four minutes. Because it's very interesting what happens. You, you've done it? Oh, yeah. But who crucifies you? No, no, that was just so I could find, uh, so I can get the feel of it. I wanted to see what it was like. We're crucifying a Jew. Say, say that to them. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Behave, Daddy. You're just so shocked by how you feel. Yeah. Once your feet are taken off the ledge, you suddenly hang up there. Okay. Your instinct is you want to arch your way back up, uh -huh. you know? Because the muscles, for the muscles. You, your body starts going to shock because it doesn't want to stay like that, mm. hanging. Then what happened after 30 seconds? I just began... felt very uncomfortable. I mean, in a sense that almost like, I can't describe it. It's, it's very, very bad feeling. It was surprising. I didn't expect to feel that bad that quickly. I'm done. And there's one more twist. Another reason why we don't find more nails stuck in bones. Just think of your lucky rabbit's foot. We know from several sources the nails uh, were considered to be very uh, important amulets. And people might have retrieved those nails uh, for amulet purposes. I find it very hard to believe that Jews would be walking around with nails that were used to crucify their family members and say, this is going to bring me good luck. Uh, actually, we know that from the Talmud. So we know that both Jews and Gentiles use that as amulets. And so this would be a reason for us not finding them. It would not explain why we don't find skeletons with pierced heel bones. You did find one. Yeah, so you, you know, it's, it's always that uh, in archaeology that we, when we find one thing, we say, why don't we find more? The fact is that we found one. And the question is, what do we do with the information that we can retrieve from that one find? When we find more, we'll know more. And that's the final twist. We find almost no evidence of crucifixion today because the nails were too valuable as magic talismans to leave stuck in the dead. People simply took them from the victim after death for good luck. Real symbols of death prized for their imagined ability to preserve life. In biblical times, being sick was often viewed as divine justice. If you suffered from blindness, skin disease, or maybe a bum knee, chances were that you brought it on yourself. Falling ill was no picnic. Not only did the ancients lack basic medical care, but sometimes those with the mark of sickness were banished. And of all the illnesses you could get, nothing was worse than leprosy. According to the Gospels, the only cure for this terrible disease was the hand of Jesus. But many scholars now believe that due to a mistranslation of the Hebrew Bible, Jesus might not have been curing leprosy after all. A stunning new archaeological find may actually hold the answer. With archaeology as my guide, I'm going to take a closer look at ancient medicine and get to the bottom of this leprosy mystery. But first, I want to find out where the ancients went to soothe what ailed them. The Bible says water was a great healer. It outlines the benefits of washing and bathing, 
and both Jews and Christians used water to purify body and soul. And I've just heard that archaeologists have uncovered a giant ancient pool near Siloam in Jerusalem. Could this be the famous pool mentioned in the Christian Bible where Jesus healed the blind man? A man called Jesus made clay and anointed mine eyes and said, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and I received sight. I'm going to meet up with archaeologist Gabi Barkai to find out if this is the same pool. We are now in the ancient pool of Siloam, which was discovered just uh, in the last month. So is, is this one of those magic moments where the Bible and archaeology meet? This is the very pool which is mentioned. There is no other alternative. The dating of the pool is secure. It is uh, first century. You can imagine Jesus standing here curing people. This is the very pool. And the pool so, is where? Right so here. the pool is this large orchard here with the uh, pomegranate trees. Next to the uh, pool here, we see the remains of the steppe edges, uh, which is mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter 9, as the place where Jesus uh, cured the uh, blind man. And people gathered here in order to find remedy for their uh, troubles. So this must be one of the most important biblical archaeological finds ever, actually connecting Bible with archaeology. Yes. Pretty amazing. So, according to the Gospel of John, it was here at the Pool of Siloam that Jesus cured the blind man and the discovery of the pool gives new life to the story. But what about the stories of Jesus healing lepers? Has anything been found that corroborates these tales? Scholars are skeptical. They point to a mistranslation of the Hebrew Bible where the term tsarat was incorrectly replaced with leprosy. Today, Hansen's disease is the correct name for the ailment that causes body parts to fall off. According to scholars, Hansen's disease didn't exist during Jesus' time. So whatever he was curing, it wasn't leprosy. What was it? Professor John Kloppenberg, first century expert, explains. Tsara and lepra, or lepros uh, in Greek, probably refers to the same physical ailment, which is a kind of psoriasis, perhaps, or a skin blemish. Not really leprosy. In the Hebrew Bible, it's not Hansen's disease. And probably in the New Testament, it's not Hansen's disease either. The problem is that when you use a word like lepros, and then subsequently lepros gets identified with Hansen's disease, it becomes, it becomes a uh, sort of an automatic equation that, that Jesus is, is curing people from leprosy. But you telling me he just cured people of the heartache of uh, psoriasis? psoriasis. <laughs> That's what we're talking about? Well, we might trivialize this, but if you, if you read the injunctions in Leviticus about what one has to do as a leper, you are separated from your social unit, from your family. So the heartache of psoriasis was not so much the, the actual itching, was the, 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 it was a sign of impurity. It's a sign of impurity which, separ which, which causes you to be separate from the rest of society. So according to Professor Kloppenberg, there was no real leprosy at the time of the Old Testament in the Holy Land. But I'm not convinced that it hadn't arrived by Jesus' time. Before I investigate this, I need to understand disease and biblical times. And it's clear from the Bible that quarantine was often used to isolate sick people, not just lepers. Does this mean that all sick or disabled people were left out in the cold? There's a forensic pathologist in Tel Aviv who's found some ancient bones that tell a very different story. In ancient times, leprosy was the most feared of all diseases. Not just because it was incurable, but because the Bible decreed that lepers must be cast out from their homes. A leper's lot in life was one of solitary suffering. So, does this mean that all sick people were shunned by society? Dr. Baruch Arensberg says no. He's been collecting ancient bones for years. He can read a bone like a book. And the bones in this box have a surprising story to tell. They reveal that the ancients were not heartless, but compassionate. We have here from the Roman period, oh, and I see. you can see these are uh, bones that were found 
not far from uh, Jerusalem, and you can see that inside, twisted. inside of the vertebra, it is divided by a wall. How old was she when she died? She was around 25, 30 years old when she died. That's significant. In ancient times, people lived shorter lives. Disabled people's lives were shorter still. Finding ancient bones that show severe disability and a relatively long life can only mean one thing. So this, somebody looking at this sees a pile of bones. You look at this and you say, this shows me that the community took care of its disabled. Uh, absolutely. This is the best case. And the importance is not only on the pathology, but on the environment, on wow. the social conditions they were living. The, wow. So that means people, people cared for each other. Yeah. Aaronsburg's collection shows us that in biblical times, compassion was the first step in any treatment. But compassion alone doesn't mend broken bones. So who did the ancients go to for more sophisticated care? I'm meeting Ofra Rimon, curator of the Hecht Museum in Haifa. She's gathered an astonishing array of medical paraphernalia from the first century that helps us understand what kind of treatment was available to ancients who fell ill. Okay, here we see medical instruments. Wow, how old are these? 2,000 years ago. No way. There was a custom to bury the physician along with all the instruments that he used in his life. You mean like if he screwed up and didn't save the patients, they buried him with his uh, no, tools? No, no. Right? Okay, Simcha, let's focus on what we have here in this vitrine. You can see that the instruments are very delicate, very small in size. For instance, the scalpel. Scalpel. And what you have here is just the handle. There was a blade here. Yes, it was made of iron, but iron oxidized, and that's why it was not preserved. Did they use it for operations? Yes. Another medical instrument is the probe. Where and did, it was where used, did they probe? <laughs> they were used for examining cavities in the body. I can imagine 2,000 years ago, patients going, not the probe, doctor. Yeah. <laughs> Anything but the probe. OK. Examining these ancient surgical instruments shows me just how sophisticated first century medicine was. But what about pain? Opium. Opium, yes. Uh, this vessel is 3,000, more than 3,000 years old, and uh, it was produced in Cyprus. You can see the similarity between it and between the shape of the poppy seed. It's so much alike. Even the color, eh? Even the color, exactly. Now, were they doing that for entertainment reason or for medical reason? It was mainly for medical reason. You can use the opium while you have pains and also by drinking. You know, they, uh, oper they operate people. Oh, and it's like an uh, anesthetic. Yes. So this is a 3,300-year-old 3, anesthetic in a sense, or yeah, at least the medicine. Yes, exactly. Were lepers using imported opium? I don't think so. I wonder what other medicines were available. Today, there's a lot of attention paid to the healing powers of plants and herbs. But what about the ancients? Dr. Sarah Salon, founder of the Natural Medicine Unit of the Hadassah Hospital in Jerusalem, has been studying how the ancients used these early medicines. So tell me about herbs in the Bible. There are many, many, many plants that are mentioned in the Bible. The prophet Ezekiel says, the fruit shall be for food, the leaf for medicine. So he saw f fruit as food, but he saw the prim primary function of herbs as medicine. Yes, of course. Ezekiel, I mean, Ezekiel. that's a heavyweight. They're all heavyweights. <laughs> there are no lightweights. <laughs> in the Bible. No, no, no. But the local people in this region for thousands of years have used these medicinal plants as folk medicines. Is there any kind of detective work involved? Did you look in the Bible, find out some herb, ate it and cured leprosy with I it? I just want to say that there are many roots to the same truth. We took many of these medicinal plants and we grew our own medicinal plants based on the wild seeds. So you grew biblical plants? Yes, we grew biblical plants. And then we harvested them and then we began to test them. And what do we find so far? Well, we find that they were right. They really do have a very powerful anti 
bacterial activity. Do they make a good salad? Some of them do, and some of them taste really awful. <laughs> really horrible. Really bad. We're also looking at them for their effect on the immune system. And we find that some of those herbs mentioned in the Bible, like the Artemisia, do have a significant effect on the immune system, a positive boosting effect on the immune system. In terms of the, the uh, Gospels, Jesus' time, yeah. is there anything mentioned there? Myrrh, mentioned in the Bible by the three kings bringing gifts of myrrh. Why myrrh? Because of its use in anointing, but also as a medicine. It was more valuable than gold. You have to understand that in the Bible itself, there are very few references to actual disease and a plant. One of the few references is when Hezekiah has boils all over him and the prophet Nahum gives him figs to eat to cure the boils. Now people are looking at figs and they find that they are anti-infective and they're also anti-cancer, apparently. Coincidence? I think not. There are no such things as coincidence, <laughs> especially when we're talking about the Bible. Dr. Salone's research proves the Bible's health tips really do work. But I've heard that another plant was used in ancient times. A plant that's illegal today, but one we've all heard of, and maybe even tried. Cannabis. Were the ancients just toking up to relieve the pain? I feel very good. Can somebody help me stand up, please? Herbal medicines were used in ancient Egypt as far back as 10,000 BC. Over the centuries, much of this knowledge made its way around the ancient world. The Bible recognizes the therapeutic properties of strong wine and a few herbal concoctions. And that's about it. But some are suggesting that by Jesus' time, the ancients were getting high for medical purposes. Professor Raphael Mechulam, expert of pharmacology at Hebrew University. He's figured out what the ancients would have reached for when they were in pain. Well, my lab is a chemical lab. We work in chemistry and pharmacology, mostly medicinal plants, in particular cannabis, marijuana, hashish. Over You're the an last expert on marijuana. Well, I've worked on that for many years. We identified the active compound in marijuana, THC. Now, wasn't some uh, cannabis found in a tomb yeah. here in Israel? They found a Roman tomb near Bet Shemesh, 20 kilometers south of Jerusalem. They found a young girl there that had died at the age of 14, maybe. She was pregnant, too small to give birth, and therefore she was obviously in fantastic pain. And they found some ashes next to the remains. So they gave us the ashes to analyze and we found traces of cannabis. It shows that at that time they were using cannabis. Oh, they used it for pain, they used it for uh, uh, <coughs> apparently what we would call antibiotic, they used it for some stomach problems. They knew uh, quite a lot about cannabis and they used it. As I walk the streets of Jerusalem, I think about how easy we have it. Doctors and hospitals, easy access to medicine, the ancients didn't have it so good. The best these pharmacologically challenged people could hope for was a few puffs on a marijuana pipe. I'm not about to try cannabis myself, but I will try the next best thing, a traditional Middle Eastern treat, the hookah. It might just be what the doctor ordered. I'm gonna have my first Nargila experience. The Nargile, a Turkish water pipe. The tobacco is placed in the metal top and kept burning by a small piece of charcoal. The smoke is cooled by being drawn through the water in the bowl. This is a first for me, and they assure me this is tobacco. Take my little piece of coal and stick it on top. All over the Middle East, to this very day, people understand about medicine and the therapeutic use of smoke and tobacco. The smoke may not be good for you, but just relaxing and not doing any chores, that's good for you. Just the general attitude that you're getting away with it is very therapeutic. Very nice, very nice. <coughs> I think my coal is not hot enough. I have a de deficient coal. Oh yeah. <laughs> 
I can get used to this. This is just sit around. Just sit here and relax, right? Relax. Let the wife take care of things, huh? Crazy. What have I been thinking all these years? <laughs> I am getting a little lightheaded. Actually, I'm getting quite lightheaded. I feel very good. Can somebody help me stand up, please? Can somebody help me stand up? Time for me to take a walk and clear my head. The effect of the smoke was a little more than I anticipated. The hookah may not actually cure anything, but it definitely has some kind of anesthetic property. I feel pretty good. But what if you had leprosy? The Gospels tell us Jesus healed it. But that was a miracle. And many scholars reject the notion that Jesus healed leprosy at all. Some go so far as to say that leprosy didn't even exist at the time of Jesus. But now, archaeology has proven them wrong. We're going with archaeologist Shimon Gibson to an ancient cave where he made the discovery of a lifetime. He's found the world's oldest leper. The Gospels give four examples of Jesus healing leprosy. But was it really leprosy? Many scholars say no. They claim leprosy didn't exist in Jesus' time. This brings me to the Hinnom Valley, where a Jewish burial ground has stood for almost 3,000 years. It's here that Professor Shimon Gibson has single-handedly solved the leprosy mystery. What's the significance of this tomb? Well, here we have the oldest evidence of uh, leprosy in existence. Anywhere? Relating to Hansen's disease, where you have a nose falling off and disfigurement and, and, and so forth. Do we have any example of leprosy anywhere in the world earlier than this? Not as far as I'm aware, no. Let's go in. There are going to be possible spiders, rabid dogs, sharp stones. You're not joking. Possible no, I'm not joking. Possibility. And you're lucky you've got big boots on. We're what about tomb fever? There's such a thing? No, it's called K fever. Yeah. I actually was ill with it. They're little bugs. What they do is they infect your bloodstream and then uh, you'll go crazy. Well, you're already crazy. So. Nobody will notice, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay, let's, let's go in now. Watch out for the spiders. Sound man's not coming in. No light man. Doesn't stop the naked archaeologist. Oh, my goodness. I found an ancient battery. Mm, good. How do we do this? Well, you've got to take that. OK. And then I'm going to go down. See your bait, yeah? So this is the first tomb chamber as soon as you come into the cave. Um, and in the walls, you have these loculi in which the bodies were placed. The tomb robbers decided to check on one of these loculi, which turned out to be access to a lower chamber. Now, this is a very deep shaft here. There are all these slugs on the wall. Yeah, come on down. Whoa. I hate that slug. Some people eat slugs. You know? They eat slugs? Yeah. You got to How do you get through this without touching the walls? Yeah, you just slide forward. OK, this is very, all very intimate. Uh, I just want to make sure there's no dog or something going there. What the hell is that cocoon thing? Dunno. Just remember, we gotta, we got to get out of here. Okay? Don't get nervous. You're with me. <laughs> <laughs> do you see one of the bones here? Look, oh, do you see here? This is one of these uh, burial niches in which the bones were placed after the body had decomposed. You can see this, this is part of a leg bone. There's even part of a jaw here. These are the stone slabs which covered the entrances to the loculi, and they've all been ripped off. This first century crypt once contained dozens of ossuaries, or stone burial boxes, all of which have either been destroyed or stolen. Jewish burial practices at the time specified that the bodies of the recently deceased had to be set out in niches. And then, after the bodies decomposed, the bones would be gathered up and placed in ossuaries. Only one loculi was overlooked, sealed shut with a deadly secret. You see the cement here? There's a very hard cement. They cemented it up. Now, there's apparently a reason for that. I think they feared disease. If they feared that the person was sick from something contagious, they wouldn't take the bones and put them in an ossuary. They'd just seal them right there. Until tomb robbers came into the cave, and they ripped open the door. What they saw was just some brown muck, and it's a, it's a, a very important find. 
hidden by that muck were human remains. Samples of these bones were sent to Thunder Bay, Canada, home to one of the world's leading forensic pathology labs. After years of analysis, scientists uncovered something new to the world of archaeology. From the medical results, we know that he suffered from Hansen's disease. It was quite advanced um, uh, leprosy, apparently. Evidence of the oldest leprosy in the world. Yeah. Let's get out of here. OK. We may never know if Jesus actually healed leprosy. But with these dates confirmed, Gibson's discovery proves that leprosy did exist during Jesus' time, most likely introduced to the Holy Land by Roman soldiers returning from India. With the cure being almost 2,000 years away, ancient lepers had little hope. Yet they still had a surprisingly complex range of options. For the most part, the ancients relied on what we would call alternative therapies, primarily herbal medicines, many of which hold the same properties as modern drugs. And if they didn't come across Jesus, there was always the hookah to ease the pain. And the Bible itself offers some very healthy advice about hygiene, diet, and quarantine, with archaeology providing a sound second opinion. I know this is stupid, but I didn't know strong tobacco could make you high. What is the most famous book of all time? You guessed it, the Holy Bible. Most of us have a copy of it in our home, whether we're believers or not. So have you ever thought about who wrote it? Who wrote the Bible? God. God wrote the Bible? Lots of people. Lots of people? Yeah. Some scholars in the ancient time. This is a tough one. God gave the, the Torah to Moshe on, on Mount Sinai. Do you ever think about who wrote the Bible? I never thought about it. The Bible. When people say the Bible, they actually mean different things. The Quran, the New Testament, the Old Testament. But one thing that uh, Jews, Christians, and Muslims agree on is that, from a religious point of view, there was a revelation on Mount Sinai to Moses. God dictated, God lectured, Moses wrote it down. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. But in the 19th century, scholars come and say, let's get serious, that's not what happened. Moses didn't write it, and God didn't dictate it, and in fact, there is no single author of the Bible. There are different authors. The books of Moses are the foundation of Western civilization. For thousands of years, Jews and Christians believed that after Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, he climbed Mount Sinai, where God spoke to him, and Moses wrote down every word. But today, many religious people are siding with the scholars who say there were many authors, and not one was actually Moses. So who wrote them? Was it one author or many? Maybe archaeology can help us answer that question. Before I start digging around, I need to understand what this many-author theory is all about. In Jerusalem, I spoke with Franciscan monk, Father Hoppe. From your perspective, who, who, who wrote the Bible? Well, the Bible is an anonymous work for the most part. So it doesn't say this was written by Moses. Do you believe it's divine or human? These books are religiously authoritative. That is, they guide a person's beliefs and practices. But what exactly inspiration means, uh, does it mean dictation? Well, very few people would say that it means dictation. So you don't believe God dictated the first five books to Moses? No. You don't? No. Has there ever been a time when Father Hoppy could have been burnt at the stake for what he thinks? Actually, probably not. Christians have been debating this Moses authorship for 500 years. And then, in 1943, the Catholic Church decided to weigh in on the argument. It sent out a memo. Moses probably didn't write the Bible. The Church had now bought into an academic theory begun in the 19th century that the Bible is composed of texts by many ancient authors. Must be one convincing argument. Let's hear what the scholars have to say. I spoke with Baruch Halperin, biblical scholar, to see if he can convince me that the Bible is a product of many authors. I've been sitting here and I've been wondering. I sit, I stand, I sleep, I wonder, 
Who wrote the Bible? A bunch of different people. I read the five books of Moses, the Torah, and I never get the feeling that Joe wrote book number one and Sam wrote book number two. I don't get that impression. That's because you're coming at it from the pers perspective of the tradition rather than from a fresh, unbiased view. I'm fresh. I just read it. I know you're fresh. I'm fresh. I read it, and nowhere do I get the feeling that there's different authors. The basic argument is that you have a series of doublets, that is, pairs of identical or nearly identical stories with slight variation. In Genesis, there seem to be two versions of the creation of Adam and Eve. In one, God creates animals first and humans later. In the other, God places man in the Garden of Eden, man is lonely, so God creates animals first and women later. It wouldn't take much to reconcile the stories, but scholars say the two versions demonstrate that these biblical stories were written by two groups of Jews. One group called God Jehovah, the other group called God Elohim. This was sometime in the 9th century BC. Now Leviticus and Numbers are so full of laws that scholars said they had to have been written by a priest, maybe in the 7th century BC, to teach people that sleeping with the Canaanite girls just wasn't cool. A little later, some dude, definitely not Moses, wrote Deuteronomy that included the story of Moses' death. Then, in the 6th century BC, an editor stitched all the scrolls together to make Judaism look like one unified front. Voila, the documentary hypothesis. The thing is, not all scholars agree on four authors. Some say there were just three, and others say there were more than five. Where is the logic to this mad science? Part of science is that it's replicable. Meaning, I've never seen two documentary hypothesis theories that actually agree with each other. Isn't it by nature of, if this is a scientific step forward, that someone should be able to agree with somebody else? In the humanities, scholars make a business of disagreeing with each other. Now, this is science. No, it's history. History is fiction. <laughs> it really is. I mean, it, it's, it's a attempt, form of fiction. With an attempt to get to some historical kernel. Exactly. In my opinion, the multi-author theory is not convincing. When I read the books of Moses, I hear one voice. Even though the scholars oppose me, I'm no chicken. I'm on a mission to prove there's one author, not more. A lot of people think the books of Moses are the product of several authors. I believe those books are written by one author at one point in history, and I'm going to prove it. Now, whether that author is God is a matter of faith, which leads me to Anshay Minsk Synagogue in downtown Toronto, where I spoke with Rabbi Spiro. It was Thursday morning after the traditional reading from the Jewish Bible known as the Torah a reading which requires at least 10 men to be present. I'm interviewing Rabbi Spiro in Chinatown. This, is the, uh, this used to be the Jewish area, now it's uh, the Chinese area. But the synagogue goes on, and uh, the rabbi, when he's not here, is out in the street, uh, pulling people out of cafes to create the Jewish quorum of 10 men. And when he does that, the Torah is read, and that's exactly what I'm here to talk to the rabbi about, the Torah. <clears throat> that's a subject that's near and dear to your heart, isn't it? Yeah. So who's the author of the document that you read from today? The Torah that we have here originates in what Moses wrote down. As given by God to As Moses. As given by God, yeah. How accurate is this, from your point of view, this transmission process? Like if you're reading and suddenly you find a letter missing. We open the ark and we use another Torah scroll you to mean, continue the reading. You mean the whole thing grinds to a halt? Think, yeah, you have to take out another Torah scroll. And you use that, meanwhile. And that one is taken to the scribe, who then corrects it. There is a tremendous respect for the word, for the letter in the Torah. The transmission process is credible. How can the rabbi be so confident that what we read today is the divine word given to Moses 3,500 years ago, and not a document that has been tampered with, like some game of broken telephone? 
I decided to meet with a scribe to ask him what method he uses to ensure precise copying. The modern Torah scribe follows age-old techniques to ensure the Torah is transcribed letter perfect. The Hebrew word for scribe is sofer, which means the counter. This word implies that his work is so precise that he must count the number of letters in each paragraph to make sure there aren't more or less than God gave Moses 3,500 years ago. I asked Rabbi Fleischer to describe for me here. how a scroll is made. It does not here. Sorry, uh, here. What, what, am I, what is this? This is the hide of an animal, parchment. You're turning it in now into a Torah, into a Bible scroll. By writing the text of the Bible on it. The scribe who writes it sanctifies his work by saying, I'm writing this to create a holy Bible. Do you have any kind of fail safes that makes you feel that the transmission process is actually accurate? The name alone tells you something. You're called a counter, a sofer. What are you counting? Let's say this has 250 letters in it. When the fellow was done writing it, he would count one, two, three, four, five, CS. Every, every letter he would count? Yeah. This is one level and one aspect of checking for accuracy. I think most people don't realize mm -hmm. that if one letter is missing, it invalidates mm -hmm. the entire sure. scroll. Well, it's, it's even finer than that. In most cases, even if two letters are touching each other, the Torah scroll is not valid. I mean, today we already have computer scans where they check on a master that highlights any inaccuracies. This is accurate to the last letter with no deviation from the Torah that Moses wrote. So you believe God dictated this text and Moses was the secretary and he wrote it down? He was the scribe. Given the scribe's extreme attention to detail, why would scholars come up with contradictory theories about a variety of unknown authors over time? I put this question to Baruch Halprin. The point is that unless you have a reason to go to the fantastical, why shouldn't you just accept the simple, which is, you know, it's not two traditions or three or four, it's one tradition. There's nothing fantastic about the idea that tradition grows over time and that various parties contribute to a tradition. Um, in fact, that's what we see in every other religious tradition that we have. You have to agree that not a single archaeological shred has ever been found of the existence of the documentary hypothesis. That's absolutely correct. Okay. To prove that the Bible was written once by one author, all I need is archaeology that shows the text has not changed since it was first written some 3,500 years ago. Can archaeology really resolve this debate? Thanks to an accidental discovery of scrolls from 2,000 years ago, found by the shores of the Dead Sea, I think it can. I'm on my way to Qumran, where a boy went for a walk with his sheep one day in 1947 and by accident made the discovery of the millennium. He found hundreds of holy writings from 2,000 years ago, which included a Bible 1,000 years older than any Bible known to modern man. We have almost a letter-perfect version of the Bible from the Dead Sea Scrolls that were found in that very cave. It was found by a goat or a sheep. It probably was a goat. Sheep wouldn't make it up there. I, I revised my opinion. It was a goat. It went in there. The, the kid didn't want to follow the goat. Threw in a stone crack. There was pottery in there. When the shepherd went in there, found... Ah! <laughs> it found fragment after fragment after fragment of scrolls. Thousands of them. They're still being studied. And that's where they were found. The scrolls that were found in those caves are now in Jerusalem, in a special museum called the Shrine of the Book. On my trusty steed, I decided to take the scenic route to the museum. I wanted to see what the scribes were up to 2,000 years ago. On this day, I happened to be lucky to get special dispensation and bypass the scroll copies on display at the museum. I went straight to the sacred vault where the original scrolls are resting. The safe. The safe. The vault where the Dead Sea Scrolls rest. There I met Professor Flint and Professor Ulrich. 
They normally study the scroll fragments using infrared photos in the comfort of their own homes. And then they come here to double check what they've read. I wanted to know if this 2,000-year-old scroll they're looking at is word for word the same as the Bible we have today. This is the real thing, right? This is the real thing. This is the real this thing. Is, if you go to the museum, you don't see the original. You see a, a copy because this is so fragile, we just uh, uncover the part we're working on. What does work constitute? What we do is work on these at home with infrared photographs and then write out what we think it is but then come in to check because there are things that you cannot tell from photographs. You know, there are various types of things that have gone wrong, like you can tell that there was water damage there, it dried and then split. Are there letters, for example, that you might have thought it was one letter because there's this crack going through it, and then when you check it, you go, oh. Exactly. So are you That's checking right. to see whether the printed text is actually true to the... That's right. So he has an ancient scribe who may have been having some problems with his pen, and we, we try to explain this. Was he changing the text? What was he doing? What have we learned? The edition that's come down to us has been remarkably well preserved. Are there huge differences, critical differences? The traditional Hebrew texts that we have are very accurately transmitted from 2,000 years ago. Historically, we're very fortunate that the ancient Jews had a tradition of preserving the Bible and not changing it. The rabbis, if they felt there was an error, they tended to put the error in the margin. They didn't feel free to change the text. And because of their conservatism, we do have a very carefully preserved Bible. The Jewish scriptures have been preserved almost sort of by God's grace. So, by God's grace, we saw the Bible from 2,000 years ago. And it's exactly the same Bible we have today. Wouldn't that support the tradition that says the book we read today is the book Moses wrote down and handed to the Israelites 3,500 years ago? Well. Professor Halpern stopped me in my tracks when he told me Moses couldn't possibly have written the Bible. Do you think Moses wrote the Bible? No, I don't think Moses wrote a thing. You don't think he wrote a thing? Not a thing. He didn't go up on the mountain? I forgot to tell you, these people were illiterate until basically the 8th century BC. So the text meant nothing to them. I think I got him on that one. To prove my point, I went to the Sinai Desert. I got a young Bedouin to guide me to the cave where I read there was an inscription dating back to the time of Moses. It wasn't written by Egyptians, but by Hebrews. Here it is. Here's the oldest or second oldest alphabetic inscription ever. And you can still see the chisel marks. And it represents an incredible moment in human history. It's the oldest alphabetic inscription. Here you see the inscription going this way and going this way. That was the real revolution of taking cartoons or pictures or a pictographic writing system, which is what Egyptian hieroglyphics are, and changing it into a bunch of symbols that stand for sounds rather than pictures or stories. So what these writings mean is that when Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, there was an alphabet and he knew how to use it. Now what we need is the archaeology that proves Moses wrote the Bible. But where am I going to dig up a 3,500-year-old Bible? While pursuing my dream to find the original Bible, I inadvertently found evidence that blew the documentary theory out of the water. I met with Professor Gabriel Barkai, the archaeologist who has discovered the oldest biblical inscription ever found, an inscription much older than the Dead Sea Scrolls. He told me the story of how he found it while excavating 30 years ago at this ancient burial site just outside the old city of Jerusalem. OK, now, to the untrained eye, mind you, that's not me. To the untrained eye, these look like a bunch of holes in the ground. What are we looking at here? This is uh, a burial cave, 2,600 years old. Uh, we had a uh, bunch of kids uh, who were 
in the dangerous ages of uh, 12 and uh, 13. They were uh, from an archaeology club for youth. And one of those kids was especially a nagging type. I didn't know what uh, to do with this little Nathan who always had a very ugly habit of pulling my shirt from behind. And whenever I would turn around, he would ask me silly questions. He was known as Nathan uh, the Unbearable? I, I don't know his surname. When uh, I saw the entrance there uh, to the repository, I looked into it. I saw that there was a rock surface visible. Well, I thought this is also looted, as are the other caves which we previously excavated in the vicinity. I said to myself, this is the place to put little Nathan. You stuck him into the tomb? Yes, I <laughs> thought that I'm not going to see him for a while. <laughs> so I put him into this place and told him that he has to prepare it for photography. After about 15 minutes, I feel my shirt being pulled from behind. Nathan. When I, when I turn around, I see this uh, creature, Nathan, uh, with uh, almost complete pottery uh, vessels in his hands. This time, I grabbed his shirt, <laughs> and that was against all instructions. He was not supposed to move anything. He made the discovery of my life. Not his, mine. <laughs> it's, that's right. Um, OK, let's go in there. I was there already. Want to come in here? No. Is it clean in here? No. It's dirty? It is. What was the discovery? In this tomb, where Nathan found the pots, Gabby's crew found, amongst the bones of the ancient people buried here, something that appeared to be a cigarette butt. This apparent trash turned out to be two tightly rolled silver scrolls, the greatest discovery of Professor Barkai's life so far. What's this green mold on the wall? Green mold. But it took them several years to realize the real value of the treasure. When it was opened, uh, we found it is it took a- you three years. About after three years. It was uh, difficult to unroll it. When the proper method was found, we saw that it is a uh, plaque of approximately 10 centimeters in size, and upon it was covered densely with writing. On two silver scrolls, you can read a biblical passage. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. These scrolls are exactly the same as the Bible today, and they're 600 years older than the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Torah hasn't changed. The tradition is good, but the greatest discovery was yet to come. For 20 years, the scrolls sat in the Israel Museum. Then in the 90s, Professor Barkai initiated tests involving new NASA imaging techniques, which revealed more biblical writings. This time, not from the Book of Numbers, but the Book of Deuteronomy. We discovered that there is another biblical or Torah verse on it. So 25 um, years after you find this thing, you actually find a whole new thing right yes, before your eyes. Yes, wow. It was written there, keeps the great covenant. God who keeps his uh, covenant and his grace to uh, uh, his lovers and the keepers of his commandments. Beautiful. A verse. This is a verse which comes from the seventh chapter of the book of uh, Deuteronomy. And this is uh, source D. P and D together for the first time. Remember the documentary hypothesis said the priestly writing and Deuteronomy were written at different times and weren't together until the editor did his stitching? Here, on one tiny silver scroll, with the help of cutting edge technology, we found two quotes from separate books of Moses at least 100 years before the editor supposedly did his work. So we have evidence that identifies a fatal flaw in the documentary hypothesis. It's true, we didn't find the 3,500-year-old Bible Moses wrote, but give us time. 